right, let's rise and prepare our hearts to worship the Lord today. Let's go ahead. Come on, come on, come on, come on baby. Worship our Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we love you. We love you so much. Um, this is supposed to be a, a weekend of celebration uh, of our freedom, of um, the soldiers who have um, risked their lives to, to protect our freedom to be here yes. today, to worship you. Uh, without being persecuted like the rest of the world, God. And we thank you for that. Um, but so much of our nation right now yes. is mourning, is grieving yes. because yes. of what happened yes. uh, in, in the school in Texas, God. So many children, including adults, died um, because of the sins of the world, God. Father. Uh, because of sin, that uh, we suffer, we grieve, we mourn. Mm. But Father, we have hope. We have hope in you. Yes. We have yes, hope Lord. in our Son, God. Because you came, you showed us that you Lord. love us, you showed us that you don't want us to be apart from you for eternity, God. You gave your life to us. So in that, we celebrate. In that, yes, Lord. we find power, yes, we find hope. Lord. So God, I pray that the rest of the world, especially those who have directly been affected by the shooting, can feel your love this morning. Yes. And feel your grace and your mercy. Mm -hmm. And I pray that they turn their hearts to you. I pray that they find hope in you, God. Because you are our only hope. So, God, we're going to sing this song to you today. Um, church, uh, we have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what, yes. what's happening in the world, we've got nothing to fear because right. Jesus is on our side. Amen. Jesus died for us. He conquered death. So that we do not have to suffer death. Uh, we do not have to Resurrection life in Jesus. So let's celebrate that. Let's sing that with all of our hearts. Um, let's let's start with the first song. I will rise.
God, we are going to rise with you. Uh, Lord, when we take our last breath, we're going to rise to you. If you come back before um, we take our last breath, we will rise with you. Uh, we know how the ending is going to be, God. Yes, Lord. Uh, because you are a God who wants to be known. You are a God who doesn't want to keep us guessing um, about what the future holds for us. So thank you for this hope, God. Yes, Lord. But until you come back, God, I know that Lord. you want us to be the light of the world, God. You want us to shine bright so that people can see your glory, people can see your love. Yes. So church, as believers, as disciples of Christ, mm. let's give our lives to him yet again. Every, every day we dedicate our lives to him. Because we can always go deeper. We can always know God more. We can always allow Him to work through in our lives more and more. So as we continue to worship Him tonight, ask God, God, how can I be that light? What do I need to do to give up? What do I need to do to surrender to you? My fears, my pains, my failures. Surrender all of that to God today as we continue to worship Him.
of the Lord today, uh, to, to listen to this message, God. I pray that um, that you pour your spirit into Pastor James, God. Yes, Lord. Um, may your word um, be spoken through him, God. Um, may you soften our hearts today, God, to listen to this message and, and to know how much you love us, how much you forgive us, how much you just want to be with us, God. So we love you, Father. Thank you for the space. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that no greater love will it is for one man to live life down. Amen. For amen. Amen. And that's what we're celebrating this whole weekend mm. is that men and women mm. went and laid their life down so we can freely worship today in the house of the Lord. Good morning, So, with that said, my name is Pastor Art Rojas, and I would like to welcome you to our 11 o'clock Sunday worship here at Hillside. And if you don't know anybody, would you get up, introduce yourself, and meet someone new today. Amen? Time we're here, feel free not to even give or anything. We just want to welcome you with love and uh, yeah, just welcome you into the house of the Lord. Amen. So let's just uh, bow our heads in reverence and uh, bless our offerings and our tithes this week. Father Lord, we just thank you, Father God, for your your goodness, Lord. We have been so, so good to this community up here at Hillside. Yes. Lord, we continue to pray, Father God, for the the lost, Father God, the little kids that were lost. The yes. Ladies, uh, continue to send ministries out for the Lord that, that will cover them in prayer and, and guide them through the morning, Father. Lord, we pray and we thank you for the sacrifice of our servicemen and women, Lord, that went before us, Father God, yes. and fought for we could be here today. We lift up our tithes and our offering to you. Lord, Father God, give us the wisdom and the understanding, the knowledge and the know-how. We use them to build the kingdom of God each and every day as we go on missions, outreaching, and Father God here to welcome newcomers yes. to our church. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So yeah. Jake, you got double today. Double. Double, double, double kind of, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Pastor Jane and Pastor Sam pick their brain, ask hard questions, build a relationship with them. And the second one, how many of you guys had the nacho two weeks ago in the front room? Oh, Pastor Sam, you guys need to. Oh, come on. More people than that, right? So before it was so good, my kids devoured before I could even have a bite. So, do join us. Um, we have actually a target to reach $9,500 to support 19 people going on this trip. Wow. So, I went on the Indian mission for two weeks. It was $3,900. So, you're just saying, you. that's just wow. one person. Wow. And $9,500 for 19 people. Do you support? We're halfway there. So, you can give online. The link is on the program or bring some cash to get some yummy hot dogs. And then number three, how many of you guys are part of a small group already? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Wow. Okay. We, we need to have more people signed up. Yes. <laughs> That's where the magic happens. 
friends, through relationships are developed, and experiencing God at work through prayer and through relationship building. And so join us at sign up with Pastor Hill, uh, Derek, or find out from one of our pastors, Derek, me, Lenny, and also we have a new member, David. Next week he'll be doing the announcement, get to know him. Uh, he'll be the interim pastor as well. And then if you have kids, Christian Education DBS. Uh, the form is ready. You go to the building in the back uh, where Christian education is and get the form. It will be from June 24th through the 26th. And bring your bread donation. Wow, our church is really blessed. Last week was the first week I've actually joined to organize and clean our meeting room. And the blessing is how high up. <laughs> like literally high up. And we found some expired food and all that just because there's just too much blessing and you know, we need to pause a little bit to organize a little bit well so nothing goes to waste and we have bigger capacity to serve our community. So do save your generosity until further notice. Um, and lastly, Spring Cafe volunteer. We're looking for, for, for baristas. Who likes coffee here? Anyone like coffee? If you want a chance to learn latte art, work with the machine, we offer training. No experience is needed. There's free shit that you guys can sign up with. It'll be a lot of fun. Sign up with uh, Deacon Isaac Kim and find out like, more information by emailing him, okay? And that'll be it for today. And well, uh, we see all of you there, and it's Pastor Sam Cole, uh, Hillside LA. You know, we are doing something amazing uh, during this missions trip. There's one young uh, lady that I've been ministering to ever since we started going out to Baja. Her name is Michelle. Um, now, Michelle, she was like, 10 years old, I think, when I started, you know, going on over there, and I've seen her grow. As we go there twice a year, one of the, the greatest things that I think we do as a church is go to the same place over and over and over again to build relationships and do things that are even greater scale. So, you know, from the beginning till now, we help them set up the church, and now gospel is spreading all out all throughout Baja, including San Quentin. But this young lady, I've seen her grow, and uh, we've even celebrated celebrated her, uh, is it Kim Santana? Right? And also celebrated her, her, um, uh, her graduation. And then, so we were really, um, we were really, uh, journey with her in life. And, uh, a couple years ago when we returned, she graduated high school. And one of the things that, uh, we saw when, when she celebrated all this hope. You know, anybody, like, after you graduate high school, you just have all this hope for life, right? And then the next year we came back, I saw her cleaning hotels there. And I was so sad because she had so many gifts, including leading worship. Like she led worship at her church as a, as a teenager. And it was she had an angelic voice. And so my heart and our team, our hearts were being broken. And then so we asked Michelle, hey, what's your dream? You know what she told me? My dream is to go to worship school, to go to seminary. And when we heard that, our hearts broke. And our whole team was just sympathizing. And Justin, Jill, and myself said, you know what, we can't let this happen. We can't let this happen. We gotta allow, we gotta allow hopes and dreams that people have of God to flourish and come to fruition. Can I hear an amen? We gotta allow that. The only reason she couldn't do that was because of poverty. There are barriers because of poverty. Guess what, church? We know all about this. Hillside LA exists to make sure that people who are in poverty get chances upon chances upon chances. We exist to break those barriers of poverty. Can I hear you again? That's what we do. So we have decided, church, we have decided to give her a full scholarship, a full ride. Four years, guys. Four years. And in the love of Christ. And so when you guys are funding us, these are the things that we're knowing. We're not just going out there, although the gospel is important. I feel like there is a deeper reach to the gospel. Amen. 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 There's a deeper reach, deeper things that we can do. And so pray for us, donate, do whatever you need to do. And then, like, you know, I was talking about second chance. You know, the thing about this side of the if you notice, uh, a lot of our pastors, uh, even the gangsters back in the day, 
Pastor Art kind of upset my gift. Really used to write. <laughs> We have Levy, who's kind of an ex gangster. Hey, Levy, hi. You're kind of a gang, ex gangster guy. Right? He's like, he's turning back right now. But you know, the Lord is so powerful because no matter what you were back in the day, the, the Lord's power is that he just take just some, some messed up people like me, like y'all, and not only allow them to have a new life, but minister in the power of the gospel because it's not our power, it's God's power that transforms us. Can I hear you? We have, a, we have a brother, his name is David Park, and he's been serving, and he's been going into, uh, he has gone into Biola and studying theology right now. He's been to many churches, and he hasn't had an opportunity, because sometimes when you look at a guy like David, a bunch of tattoos and everything, a lot of pastors could be a little freaked out. But not me, because Cowboy knows I'm kind of like a gangster pastor anyway, right? right now. So we're going to have another intern. Come on, David, can you come on up? We have another intern. David Clark. We have a question. We are sharing your heart. You know, as you come into the ministry, like, what are some of the things that you want to do to serve the Lord? No, I did not want to be up here today. So, um, yeah, honestly, um, I'm just, I, I feel really blessed uh, to be here. You know, um, like Pastor Sam was saying, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of different churches, and right off the bat, when people just see me, uh, they're very judgmental. Um, and this, it's not just only the normal people that judge me, it's also the pastors and stuff like that. So, um, anyhow, uh, you know, I feel very loved here. I'm very thankful to have a mentor like Pastor Sam. Yeah. And just a family like you guys. You know, everyone here is very welcome. So, uh, if anything you know, I'm here to serve you guys. I mean, God has really uh, saved my life, so um, and blessed me. So I just also want to, you know, give back and also be a blessing to you guys as well. So thank you. That's what we do, guys. That's what we do. Come on. Now love it. Come on, baby. Yeah. Love it. This God does amazing things. I want to see miracles. I'm a miracle junkie. <laughs> Anybody a miracle junkie? I'm a, Come on, a salsa. I'm a miracle junkie. I want to see the Lord do miracles so that I can give Him glory. Amen. Let me say that it's not about us. There's all these amazing things that God is doing. It's not about us. It's about Him. And so with that, I want to go into um, giving us, uh, the, uh, you know, introducing our, our guest speaker. But before we do that, let's go on ahead and restart our catechism. You could all stand with me uh, in the back of uh, our brochures. It's our Catechism Day 20. You can read with me. The reason why we do Catechism is to affirm our faith and to make sure that we affirm our doctrines, what we believe. Can I hear an amen? Right? So here we go. Today's really quick. The question is what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? Answer first. He is together with the Father and the Son, true and eternal God. Second, He is also given to me to make me my true faith, share in Christ and all His benefits, to comfort me and to remain with me forever. Can I hear an amen? You know the beautiful thing is that the Lord forgives us, He comforts us, He loves on us, but that doesn't just cut off when we die here. It continues on, come on church, it continues on, right? It continues on. Thank you Jesus. You guys can be seated, and I'm going to read the passage, and I'm going to invite our pastor James Lee to speak to us. If you guys can turn to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Uh, ES, ESV is a font there, but I will be reading from the NIV, okay? So if you guys have your scriptures, you guys can go on ahead and follow them along with us. It's a little different, but it's kind of similar. Here we go, starting from verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. 
After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hard servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost in his town, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field when he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fat calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look! All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fat calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's give a round of applause for the word of the Lord, man. God's word is powerful. Come on up. Let's give a round of applause for the word of the Lord. Come on, baby. Give it to us. Thank you so much. I, I feel like I don't need to preach anymore after listening to Pastor Sam talk about missions and all the work that you guys are doing with David. Man, I just praise God for all of that. I'm sure um, all of the guest speakers that you guys have had uh, says this, but I, I really want to say that it is a joy and a privilege for me to stand here in front of you today. I know some of you uh, personally from different walks of life. Uh, I actually know Pastor Sam from way back then. Uh, I grew up in the same circle of churches with Pastor Sam. And when Pastor Sam met me, actually, I don't know if you realize this, but I, I wasn't a believer. I'm one of, one of those radical converts to Christ at 27 years old. Um, I was uh, uh, actually doing drugs with David when I was like, David, I don't mean to call you out, you know, but I just had a firm. I just had a firm. It's not just the tattoos, guys. Right? Like, David lives a real life, you know. Oh, man. Um, but really, though, it, it's like, it's really awesome. Like, I don't really know how else to say it. Like, I started out, like, smoking a little weed when I was, like, 14 years old. And everything escalated when I was, like, tweaking for, like, several years uh, with, like, suicide and and all of these like related things, right? Like gay violence and you know, legal issues and money troubles and you know all of those things that maybe some of you are all too familiar with. I've experienced them myself. And it's truly only and truly and only by the grace of God that I am here to that is why I'm going to for that. Um, I, I'm an immigrant. I am I'm a son of immigrants. Uh, my parent parents and I came over from South Korea to Koreatown in LA. I was in elementary school and I lived there for a few years and then we moved to Orange County in the city of Fullerton. I uh, went to high school there and I went to USC for uh, my undergrad, study business, but uh, that was all the front because in the back and I was just struggling with everything that I had shared with you. Uh, but after meeting the Lord, uh, 
I served at my home church, a small Korean church in West Covina. That's where I met Pastor Sam and my mentor. His name is Sam Lee. They're seminary buddies, and that's how I met your pastor. And then uh, until two years ago, I was actually serving near you guys at a church called Yongna uh, in Lincoln Heights, Chinatown, Lincoln Heights. I was there for about six years, and currently I'm in the city of Korea uh, at a local congregation called Living Hope Community Church. Uh, I'm married uh, to Hannah. We just celebrated our 10 years last November. This is our 11th year in marriage. Uh, between Hannah and I, we just have one girl. Her name's Abigail. She's nine years old, and she's in third grade. And she's just a, a bundle of joy. Uh, as a matter of fact, Abigail, I, I don't know when, uh, my, my daughter, like, she's like really spunky. Like we named her Abigail because her her uh, her name in Hebrew actually means the father's joy or her father rejoices, and that's kind of the personality that Abigail has. She's like really loud. She's like a hippie. She like running around the church without shoes. She's very um, carefree, but care less. You know that that's how I describe her to those who have never met her. But Abigail, this was maybe like. When she was like four or five, she's like nine now. And back then I was living in South Pasadena and we just go to Garfield Park off of like Fair Rose. And we just like walk around, take a stroll, like just daddy daughter time, it's real cute. But I remember this one particular day, me and Abby were just walking around the park and then there was a couple in front of us and they were like, they were making out. Right? Like, there's no minors here, right? Okay, okay. They're, they're like making out, you know? And I'm, I'm with Abigail, and she's like four years old, or like five years old, you know? So I'm like, all right, like, I probably don't want like my preschool daughter to see that and ask the questions. So and before it gets awkward, I'm gonna walk past them. So like, you know, I'm walking by real fast, you know, whatever. And then, I don't know what got into her, probably the Holy Spirit, but she learned this song in her preschool, and it's called God is Watching Over You. <laughs> God is watching, watching over you. 24-7 watching over you. Hey, you know what? Like, and I don't know why, but like, she starts to sing this song, like, as we're walking by the couple. You know, and they like freak out. They were like, the Lord is speaking to them, you know? So they like, let go of their hands, and they're like, in social distance. It's not even COVID, you know? This is like five years ago. And I was like, Hey, I'm sorry guys, like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know why she's saying that. But, you know, this is one of my favorite stories to tell, and it gets a laugh every time, because I, I realize that the reason why this is funny is because no matter how much we have received the grace of our God, and, and, and indeed He is gracious, right? But there's something about our culture, and maybe something about our brokenness, that forces us to think that somehow our God is some sort of a heavenly disciplinarian. That He is just waiting to strike us down at the one wrong move. So like, if you are young and single and you might be dating, God forbid if I have sex with her or with Him, then God's going to strike us down. If I make some sort of mistake and I start hating on my coworker, then God's going to strike me down. And we start thinking that God is just waiting in heaven to punish us. That I have seen from different, all different types of people, no matter what color you are, no matter your social economic status, there seems to be something about this American culture that's telling us that God is some sort of conditional forgiver. Today, from the story of the parable, parable of the prodigal son, what I hope to do with you is to help ourselves to know our God as the forgiving Father. That His forgiveness is different than our forgiveness. And to urge you by the power of the Spirit of God to forgive like He has forgiven us. That, that's my opening prayer today. Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Um, the context of the story, right? The story of the prodigal son, which, by the way, prodigal just means excessive, right? The, the story of the excessive son. This is what the scholars would call in the middle of a travel narrative. 
where Jesus is just walking around. He's like walking around the neighborhood in Judea and Samaria, all over the place, just teaching, sharing stories with people, teaching them a lot of the more spiritual gems that come out in the middle of the loop. That's because Jesus is just walking around, just walking around, visiting different neighborhoods, talking to different people. That's what's happening here. And in particular, chapters 15 and 16, if you notice, it's set up in a repetition of the same stories. And so I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible has little labels, right? It has little labels. In verse chapter 15, it starts out with the parable of the lost sheep. And then it continues on with the parable of the lost coin. And then it climaxes, it highlights in the parable of the prodigal son. You see, already by its placement and by its structure, the Bible author is trying to tell its audience, which is you and I today, that this story, the story of the excessive son, the story of the parable son, summarizes all of the other stories that are around it, which happen to be all similar. You see what I'm trying to say here? This is the story that really summarizes God's heart for the lost. And let me summarize the content of the story for you. It's about 20 something verses, a little, uh, a good chunk of a story here. First, there's a son, right? He's a younger son, and he tells his dad, I want my entitlement money early, or I want my inheritance money, excuse me, early. And then he gets the money, but he goes out with the money and he just blows it off. And then he returns to the father to ask for forgiveness. And the father not only forgives, but he celebrates the son. And then the older brother, who has not left the father, who has not wasted the money like the younger brother, gets mad at the dad about forgiving his little brother. That's the story. Younger brother gets money, Blows it all, father forgives, older brother gets mad. That's the story here. We have to build that the wrongdoing of the younger brother is actually a lot more than what we can typically understand just by reading this story as 21st century people. First of all, in verse 12, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Now, I, I'm going to guess that for those of us who are lucky enough to have parents growing up or whatnot, that we might have asked like little money from our parents or whatsoever. And perhaps some of you guys are blessed with really well-to-do and capable parents financially, that you can actually ask for a lump sum of money or inheritance or whatnot. This wasn't a simple matter, right? In biblical times, getting inheritance money was only designated at the death of the parents. And the child, because they were considered properties of parents, especially of the father, who was the, the patriarch of the family, asking for inheritance money early on was an act of serious entitlement and disrespect that was punishable by death. That children at biblical times, in the New Testament times in particular, were properties of their parents. And the parents could actually do whatever they would like to with them, including punishing them by death in serious enough of cases. And this was one of those. Because it wasn't like this guy was going up to the dad and saying, hey dad, you know, I really love you. You're a really good dad. I respect you. Can I have some money? <laughs> it, it wasn't like that. It probably was that there was a strain that they didn't see things eye to eye. They might have hated on one another. And the younger son goes, you know what? Screw this guy. This guy thinks he's my dad. I'm just tired of him. I'm just going to go and get what I want and then leave. That's probably why he walked up to him and essentially says something like, Hey man, you're my dad, but you're dead to me. You're dead to me. And that's why I want my money that you're supposed to give me when you die right now. So already when you're reading the story, we have to read between 
legalize it into it, thinking about the culture of those times, and that tells me that there is a lot of brokenness here already. That this guy wasn't supposed to do that, but he did it anyway. And then for whatever reason, the father gives him the money, and of course, as we have all heard, the guy blows it all. The guy blows it all. What, what did he do to blow it on the video base? Like, I, I don't know, but what it tells us is in, the, in verses 15 and 16, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. The pigs. Now, if you know anyone who is Jewish, Jewish people nowadays still don't eat pigs. Pigs to Jewish people are considered unclean and unholy. These are animals that God has commanded them to not have anything to do with. It's not a simple matter of what you ate something that you're not supposed to eat. This is telling us that this guy blew his money and by spiritual defilement. The best modern equivalent that I can think of is devil worship. Like, just imagine with me, right? This guy goes to the dad and says, Hey man, you're dead to me. Give me my money. And he somehow gets his money. He goes and blows it all. Not by eating well, not by, I'm sure he did that too, but he ends up in a satanic worship temple. And he cuts himself like this, like Satan dancing. I don't know how Satan is dancing. I don't know, right? But like, just imagine that. He like sprinkles blood all over himself and throws like goats. Like, is that what they do? Like, I, I mean, I'm not sure. But the story that Jesus is telling to the Jewish audience of his times is no less than shocking. This wasn't just a common story that Jesus was saying, hey, look, yeah, there was this guy. He got his money from his rich parents. Went to Vegas, blew it all, came back after dinner, God loves you. That was it. Like, that was not it. What Jesus was saying when they received by the original audience says, like, like, WTF. You know what I mean? Like, I keep wanting to say bad words because I'm like getting into it, but like, yeah. <laughs> like, what? You know what I mean? Like, like, this was bad. Like, this guy went and worshiped the devil with his dad's money. Like, that's what he was doing. Wow. And then we hear more in later in verse 30 when the older brothers criticize him. Because it says that when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. So there is a clue to some more expected perhaps of brokenness where his money was bought. Like his money bought sex. His money probably bought other uh, vices, if you will, of, of those times that we may share at this time, right? So he squandered his money that way. In fact, the, the, the wrongdoing that the son did was so serious that when you look at verse 21, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Mm. When was the last time that you have done such a wrong thing? Hopefully never. But when was the last time that you've done such a wrong thing that you were sorry to the heavens? These clues tell us that what the son did was serious, was wrong. But the goodness of God, as the father represents God in this story, is that he forgives all of it. He forgives all of it. Yeah, he forgives all of it. In verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, the younger son. Again, the squanderer of money. The, he threatened his dad with death. He worshipped Satan with money. He slept with a bunch of people. And he knew he did God knows what. This guy. This guy came to his father. But check this out. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And then here comes the apology. Now church, follow along with me. Apology didn't come before. Apology came after. To the son who threatened the father with death and wasted his money in worshiping the devil and God knows what not. When the father saw the son, his 
heart was filled with compassion. The son didn't do anything up to this point. He was on his way back. In fact, the Bible says that the father saw him first. The father was the one who saw the son. The son was in such distress that he was just practicing. Have you been there before when you're a teenage boy or a girl? You know, I don't know, like maybe you did a little thing. You know, maybe your parents are these ways and you're just like, oh crap, like I'm gonna get in trouble. So I'm gonna just practice how to say sorry to my mom or to my dad. This is how I'm gonna say it. Maybe they'll whip me a little less. You know, something like that. Like, that's what's going on here, right? This guy's like, he's tripping out, like saying all these things to himself. And it says that the father saw that. The father saw him the way he was, and his heart was filled with compassion. And not only that, he runs. And if you know anything about the culture in biblical times, the father of the house, the patriarch of the house, he wasn't supposed to run. It was beneath him to run. It, it, it was classless, if you will. He was bringing disrespect unto himself so that he can go on and place the son who hasn't even said sorry yet. That's what's going on here. And not only that, what happens in verses 21, 22, and 23, the father brings back a robe on him, puts a ring on the son's finger, puts sandals on his feet, kills a fat calf, and cause the village to celebrate the return of the son. God is restoring his dignity, the status of the family, and sharing the joy of doing that with others around. Church, I, I wonder if you were wrong before. Have you been wrong before? Is there someone that you want to forgive or, or maybe you don't want to forgive? Who comes into your mind when I ask? What would it look like in your life to forgive that person? Or maybe it's a group of people. What would that look like? You know, I think even as Christians, right? I don't know if everyone is a Christian here, but even as Jesus followers, we can often forgive based on past memories. Or sort of a taking the good with the bad. Here's what I mean, right? Maybe you have a best friend. Maybe she's a little annoying, right? You don't really like what she does. But you know, it's cool because when you go to a restaurant, and if the server, like, isn't nice to you, your friend has, like, a fiery personality, and she yells at them. You know, it's, like, real convenient for you that way, right? So you take the good with the bad, you know? Or maybe you have a creepy uncle. You guys know me? Everyone, every family has a creepy uncle, right? If you don't know, then it's fine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding about that. I'm just kidding about that. Um, but you grow with them because there's memories. It's family. You grow with them. You know, come on, how are you gonna do this? Right? And there's some truth to that. You know, there's some truth to that. But what I'm trying to say is that God's forgiveness goes beyond the typical forgiveness that you and I think about. The Father forgives not because we have some good to offer. The Father does not forgive because He has some nice, you know, tender memories with us. Oh, you know, Joe, he used to be, you know, a nice little church boy when he was growing up. So I'll forgive him for that. You know, I know right now he doesn't know me and all that. You know. Or oh, you know, Jennifer, you know, she, you know, she's you know doing this behind my back, but you know, she also worships real loud, so you know, I'll forgive her for that. That I think is somehow creeping in our hearts that we reduce our God and his forgiveness to something like that. Because we think of forgiveness as so conditional. Right. But God's forgiveness is not like that. You know, the, when I ask myself that question, who has wronged me before? Who is someone that 
that I need to forgive, it, I have to say it's my mom. You know, um, so my, my testimony, like my, my quick testimony is that, you know, I, I, I was a drug abuser for about 12 years. And, uh, I experienced a lot of different things uh, that has to do with that, right? that, that it all came crashing down with like several years of like meth addiction. And I just, I don't even remember I share like chunks of life that I, that I simply don't remember because that's what that kind of stuff does to you. Uh, and the people that I were hanging out with, I think they really cared for me a lot, but it, it just, the lifestyle was dangerous, um, it was violent, and some of the things that I had caused were real painful, not only to, to others, but myself and to my family. And I just don't think my mom knew how to handle that. Like she, she doesn't speak English, she you know, came from another country, and she just did her best. I think she did her best. Um, and so she, I think we, we and I, we, we had a lot of resentment in our heart. And it doesn't help that like she's like a real fiery personality too. Like I don't know if some of your moms are like that. My mom is super fire, super impatient. Like she gets out of the car before the car stops. You know what I mean? Like before my dad parks the car and a full rolling stop, she jumps out. Like she unbuckles, she jumps out of the car like she's in the military or something. Like I don't know. You know, my mom's a little crazy. And I kind of like her, you know, I'm like really impatient, you know, angry Asian man, right? So it's like, that's why maybe we clash, I, I don't know, but... <laughs> anyway, like, my mom and I, like, we, you know, like, so I, I recognize that I've already done things that I really disappointed her, you know, it started really early on. But I have to say that I remember, like, I have some real, like, unpleasant memories of her, like, like, I have this one memory where, like, she was, like, yelling at me because she found, like, little pills in my drawer, and, of course, I shouldn't have done that, but, like, she, like, shoved my face down, you know, like, she, like, shoved my face down, and she was, like, like, yelling at me, like, you're an ungrateful piece of, like, whatever, and, like, you know, I came to this country for you, and, like, look where you are, like, you know, blah, 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 like, I just felt, like, you know, like, I don't know, <laughs> so, that, that just... So like after meeting Jesus and you know sobering up and you know finding faith in Him, finding new life. Like about ten years ago, I, I tried to uh, reconcile. You know, I, I tried. I confronted her, you know, as respectfully as I could. Um, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I, I I went up to her and I said, Mom, you know, like, do you remember when we were, when I was growing up? Like I did a lot of stuff and you were disappointed. And I'm sorry that I hurt you. But you know, I, I want you to know that like some of the stuff that you've done to me, and that you've said to me, were also hurtful for me too. You know, but I want you to know that I, I forgive you. You know, but 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 you know, I would like to hear that from you as well. And and boy, my mom, she was so pissed. She was like, Ooh, like oh man, like some of the things that she said to me that day, I was like, man. Aren't you a Jesus follower? Like, what's going on here? You know? Like, wow. I, I just, I, I was pretty shocked. And, and I looked at my dad and I, you know, my dad, like, my dad was the complete opposite. Like, my dad had a lot of patience with me. And he was somebody that I felt like I could always go to. Um, I've gotten into like a few drunk accidents and like I would call my dad. Um, yeah, my dad, like, he, he actually, one time he, um, he like, we, I, I got into a drunk accident by myself and he swapped, like he claimed that he did it, you know, just so that my license couldn't get suspended. Don't, don't tell, I hope there's no police officers here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> just years ago, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, who's, yeah, yeah, forget that. That's just, that's just a joke. Right? It never actually happened to me. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm saying? Like, my dad, like, he, he showed me a lot of sacrificial love and, I felt like he's always had my back. I felt like he always understood. And so even though like I did a lot of like what I wanted, you know, I always went to my dad. He was always patient and loving with me. But this time, for whatever reason, maybe he was offended and like he felt like I was attacking his wife, you know? Which that's not what I meant, but like even he looked at me and he was like, no, like you really disrespected your mom. Like, you know, like you shouldn't have looked at again. I walked away feeling like and like, I don't really know how to go about you guys anymore. And so my relationship with them is sort of like surface level. You know, we, we live about 20 minutes from each other, so I do see them. I do see them like sometimes once a month, other times once every other month, but I gotta be honest, like, when she calls me, 
Did the first thing that I think of is, dude, why is she calling me? You know? Like, not to play, you know? Like, I feel like, Jesus, give me patience. And my mom is so impatient, if I pray for too long, she hangs up. You know, like, I pick up the phone, after three minutes, she hangs up. And so many times I pick up the mom, I'm like, bro, like, why can I do that? And I call her back, and she's like, why don't you pick up? I'm like, bro, I just picked up, you know, like, oh, God bless her. God bless her. And I try to forgive her in my prayer many times, even using the name of Jesus. And of course, the name of Jesus is powerful. But I realize what's missing is my definition of forgiveness. Because when I say that I'm forgiving someone, I'm thinking about maybe what the elder brother was thinking about. Because he says, he looks at the dad, he looks at the son, and he's saying, look, this guy doesn't deserve your forgiveness. Because he didn't do anything. He hasn't done it right. That's what he's saying, right? Look, many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed you. His forgiveness is so conditional. But the Father's forgiveness is different. When God says that He has forgiven His people, it's not about what the people have done. It's God initiated. God sees the people first. And God's heart is filled with compassion first. And then God, His love overtakes His actions. Sorry, you, you know, sometimes some theologians can push back to that, but I believe that our God is so filled with love that when He sees broken people, He first sees them, and He can't help Himself but to love, to go out to work to them, to embrace them, and not just that, not just that, right? Because we often think that forgiveness is some sort of break-even point. We think forgiveness is real transactional because that guy asked at me, but I forgive him, but I didn't forget, you see? I, I, I forget, but I didn't forget. That's what we think, right? So he needs to prove that he's trustworthy. He needs to prove to me that I can trust him again, bring him back into his love. God doesn't do that. God just forgives, and then he restores. He puts the rope back on the broken. He puts the ring back on. He puts the sandal back on. He restores his status in the community by celebrating him with the barbecue. Can you believe that? Think about that person. Remember that person that you want to forgive or you don't want to forgive. Now imagine yourself forgiving that person by letting go. Not just letting go, but having compassion for that person. And not just that, not just letting them be, letting them prove their friendship to you once again, but restoring that person just because you believe that's what forgiveness means. And not just that, using your own resources to call up Hillside LA and having a barbecue out here in Corsair for that person's sake for your enemy's sake, for the backstabber's sake, for those who have wronged you and clearly should not be forgiven. That person, imagine doing that. I wonder when Jesus, who died on the cross to forgive the sins of humankind, looked at the people who were gathered at the foot of the cross and said, Father, I have forgiven them, so you now go ahead and see if they are trusted. No, he did not do that. Jesus died and said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Don't let your forgiveness be transactional, church. Let your forgiveness be transformational. Because God has forgiven each of us in a transformational love. God has seen you. God has compassion for you. God has run and embraced you in your life.
God, even to this day, is asking you to come to him so that you can be restored back into his family. And God is celebrating you with the good people here at Hillside that he has called upon. That's the way that he forgives. It's not a break-even point forgiveness. It's not a transaction, but it's a lavish and radical love and restoration. That's what God means by forgiveness. The church, I just want to let you know, yeah, God knows all the pains and the struggles that you have received in your life. He understands you. The Bible says that he knows you so well that he can count the number of hair in your head. He knows you that well. But also know that this God meets great wrongdoings with even greater love. And his forgiveness is not our forgiveness. It's not just a clean slate, but it's a full restoration. It's a full recovery with communal celebration. Romans 5.10 says this, for, for a while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. It doesn't say that we were neutral. It doesn't say for a while we were pretty good with God, we were reconciled. It doesn't say that we were doing certain things right, but not other things. It doesn't say that we didn't really know God and it was okay with it. It says that we were enemies with God when He decided to reconcile us to Himself not just easily, but by the death of the Son. And so much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. So church, who is God calling you to forgive the sin? How would you not just forgive, but lavishly restore and celebrate. Would you join me in prayer now? If you would uh, just bow your heads with me and sit in the presence of God for, for a few moments here. I'm not trying to minimize any of your pain and any of your struggles. But I'm asking you to remember the Lord's forgiveness in your life. The type of forgiveness that didn't just take us to a break-even point so that we can start living rightly again. But the type of forgiveness that saw us out when we had no idea, when we hated Him. The type of forgiveness that was filled with compassion type of forgiveness that fully restored us in our status and dignity in His family. The type of forgiveness that has shared that joy of our forgiveness with God's community. I think as broken people, the only way that we can let go and forgive like how He has forgiven us is to realize that we have been forgiven in this way. So I just ask you, church, to sit with me and remember God's forgiveness in our lives so that we may forgive those that have hurt us, those that do not deserve it. Would you pray with me now for God's strength, grace, and mercy? Let's pray together.
standard in this community under the leadership of Pastor Sam and many others. I just praise you and thank you for the real work of restoration that you are doing here. And I ask that you would remember each son and each daughter as they are so precious to you, God. In fact, they are so loved by you that you have sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to become a human, to die on the cross, to bear their sins, and not just that, by the power of your spirit, to raise him up, so that by grace, through faith, that each of them can also have eternal life in you. That even though our lives here on this earth may at times be filled with pains and ugliness and darkness, God, that we can have hope. God, that we can dare to love, not just love those who have given us love, but to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, God. And we cannot do this by our human strength, but nothing, nothing is impossible by the power of God. And so, Lord, I ask that you would empower Hillside LA, that you would love upon this men and women here that are calling out to you, God, to help them to remember your great, restorative, and celebratory forgiveness so that they too may live out this godly forgiveness so that they may experience freedom, that they may experience power, that they may experience true love as only you, God, can allow us. So thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your son. Thank you for life and love. Thank you for your spirit, God. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, oftentimes we hear the, the messenger here and uh, we pray a little bit and then uh, we haven't uh, really had an opportunity or the prayer to uh, truly forgive. Sometimes, you know, I'll, sometimes when we go outside those doors, oftentimes uh, we kind of forget. But today, uh,
got a uh, few people, just come on up, uh, who would like to lay their hands on George and Pastor Art to come on up as well. Everyone else, if you guys can just extend your hands. Out to my brother. Thank you, Lord. 